Welcome to a new episode of the Human Era Podcast, where we talk about what it's like being human in a digital age. My name is Ferry, and today I'm joined by Levi and Chan. Welcome, guys. Thank Hi. you. Thank you. Great to have you here. Uh, could you guys introduce yourself uh, quickly, uh, starting with Levi, please? Yes, of course. Thanks for having us, uh, Ferry. Um, my name is uh, Levi, Levi Nijnhuis, and I am uh, co-founder of Tink, together with Chan. Um, and uh, yeah, we are actually starting this, com this, this company. Maybe fun to have a little uh, anecdote about that. Um, we are kind of uh, having an, a background in academics. And we noticed there that we write a lot of papers and those papers are really relevant and important. But at the end of the day, they come through a shredder. And that was kind of hard for us um, to imagine in practice because theory and practice are not really the same uh, to say the least. Um, and that's why we, uh, yeah, we started Think to create impact, create impact in, uh, in society. Um, and we are uh, an automation agency as we call it ourselves, which means that we automate processes um, with different automation tools. Um, and, but I think we'll tell a lot about it uh, later on. So that's a, that's a little uh, introduction of our, our site. Cool, sounds good. And then what about you, John? Yeah, so my name is John, John Lee. Uh, I think Levy had a very good introduction already. Most of the time we have a very similar introduction because, well, our past is pretty much the same. But the key difference, I think, is that I'm like a big nerd. I think you can basically say I'm a nerd. Um, I usually, usually say to people, I breathe automation. I wake up, my curtains go up, my light go, goes on. Um, I have my washing machine connected to a Google spreadsheet so I could like analyze washing patterns of me and my family members. So I think we can safely say that I absolutely love automation. Um, and in terms of a professional career, that law for automation is pretty much the same. So that that's it from my side. That's okay, awesome. we can see the difference between John and me then. John is the tech guy, I am the sales guy. Let's put it that way. That's also <laughs> important to notice. But that's a good combination, right? Because usually the tech guys are not good at selling, but they are super good at tech and vice versa. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. That's yeah. a good introduction. We, we had a, a quick conversation before we started. Um, and I don't know if you want to share this, but you said something about having like a sort of a Bible or a book. Uh, <laughs> what is that all about? Yeah, so... Levi and I both have like our own notebook. Like this is my notebook. I have a nice sticker on it. Levi also has his own notebook. Um, but that's like, we are pretty much young people, but we love to write stuff in a notebook, like just like the old people do. Um, and I don't know why, but it happens that for us that we suddenly called it our Bible because everything is in this notebook. Like every important meeting, we write stuff down. Every not important meeting, we write things down. For this podcast, I had to get my Bible, otherwise I wouldn't feel comfortable. So that's a little bit of a short, short story about the Bible. Um, it's pretty much our notebook that we bring to every occasion. Um, and also for this podcast, of course. That's awesome. But, but do you write down things that are um, obvious for a meeting or is it more like your your secondary memory it's 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 both ways like it's i write things down prior to a meeting but i also write things down during a meeting just so i could like okay uh, we have a conversation and I, then i hear something interesting that i'm like oh i want to tell something about this but maybe not now so i can do it later and then i just write it down same for you, like yeah, yeah, right and, and it's also for like visualiz visualizations. Um, if you type things down in a computer, then you cannot easily draw things or make connections between different text boxes, or in this case, then keywords, for example, in your on your notebook. Um, so you can just easily write some things down, um, and I think that's the key part of of this notebook that we have. It makes life easier in this uh, in that sense. And it stays with you longer, right? Because if you yeah. write something down physically. Um, I think you said it also before in the in the short talk that we had before yeah. this, um, that that it's proven that if you write something down, that it sticks with you longer. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's what I heard. Scientifically proven, if I'm not correct, yep. uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, that if you write things down, you connect it to your brain in some way yep. uh, through your arm. And in that sense, um, you can remember things better when you write things down instead of reading digitally or writing digitally. Yep. So, yeah, I have this very that's interesting that's... habit, uh, Levy, you can confirm that. <laughs> when I have things to do on my to-do list, I write it down on a post-it, like, A, uh, doing this podcast, and then another post-it, uh, I don't know, programming stuff. And when I'm done with that specific task, I'll just get it in my hand, that post-it, and I throw it in the trash can. 
just for the feeling like, okay, I'm done with it. I can just throw it in the trash can. It feels much better to write it down and then throw it in the trash can. So that that's a weird habit for me, but it works for me. Yep. But it's true because physical things are connected to our brain, right? Because um, if you do do the same in a tool like Asana or any other planning mm-hmm. tool, um, you can still do the same thing, right? You can make a to-do list. Yeah. You can you can mark something as done, but it's not as satisfying as yeah. crumbling down your post-it note and throwing it away. It's like this is done and it's physically <laughs> yeah. removed from my board. Um, yeah, yep. I think it's also connected to writing things down, but it's also attached to uh, spending money. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever read the study, but if you spend money yeah. um, with like a credit card or your debit card, it doesn't hurt as much as spending cash mm-hmm. money, even if it's the same amount. Yeah, yep. I, I'm familiar yep. with that story too, yeah. That, uh, that's also a really interesting one. Um, but I also think what's interesting about what you said with Asana, for example, if you have those tools, um, the downside of writing on paper, of course, is that you cannot share or collaborate on such a, um, on, on, on progress in this case, on, for example, your product development. Um, so everyone can collaborate in a tool like Asana. That's, of course, not the good part of writing things on a sticky note. Um, but if you're the own, yeah, if you're end responsible for such tasks, then, of course, it's fine for yourself. Yeah, and if it works for you, you can also turn it into digital um, yeah. uh, pieces, right? Because uh, what we did when we started a company, Jonathan and I, in 2016, um, mm-hmm. uh, the story is that we went to McDonald's to have lunch. We were complaining <laughs> about what we were seeing. Um, and Jonathan had what we call his wooden book. His wooden book. <laughs> he has he has the same type of book that you guys have for that yeah, yeah. cover. Um, <laughs> and everything from the beginning of our organization and everything is written down by hand. And then we made that into like digital pieces that everyone could work oh. on. But just to make sure that it would stick with us and that it was like free flowing, we used cool. that book. And then whatever was necessary for the rest of the team went into like the, the digital Asana, etc. Um, yeah. But because we wrote it all down in, in 2016, again, we did a keynote last week where we use one of the uh, pages when we made a screenshot of it, well, a picture because it's it's not digital. Um, cool. And we use that to, to give an example of this is how we, how we started. Um, and we still have that book. And because we wrote it all down by hand, we still remember what's in there. So we wouldn't mm-hmm. need the book right now because we know everything that is there because we wrote it down. Everything mm-hmm. that we typed, we, we forgot half, if, yeah. if so, not even more. Um, so yeah, I, I do feel strongly and you said it, it feels like it's something for old people, uh, but I think <laughs> young people should not forget what it's like to use a pen and paper because it is so crucial. Agree. hundred percent. Agree. Agree. Actually back in the day or back in the day, not really back in the day, but at the time we were, um, studying also, then you could see in the class that everyone is using laptops. Uh, maybe I was the only one almost writing things on the paper still in my booklet. Everyone um, except Levy. <laughs> and who, but I think was... it helped. It was easy. <laughs> and you remember things better. You don't have to yeah, practice as much as uh, as you may need to when you write everything down. Because as you said, Ferry, you forget half of it. So, uh, True. yeah. But we're talking about writing stuff down, but you guys work in automation. Like, tell me more <laughs> about what you're doing in like real life besides writing things down. <laughs> Um, well, st- kind of writing things online, scripting, you could say, <laughs> with automation. Um, yeah, so what we do, we basically um, look for processes in an organization that are having problems. Those problems always come to light in the form of um, having being time uh, consuming or having different uh, several mistakes that you make in a process. And you don't want to make mistakes and you want process to be efficient. So we make sure that those processes are automated, meaning no hands needed, basically, no human hands needed anymore to execute such a process. Um, Yeah, and we use different tools for that. So um, I think John actually can tell more about those tools as he's more uh, into that. Um, One of the tools is robotic process automation. I think, Ferry, we also talked about that um, in in some earlier conversations. And what you basically do there is copy all the human um, uh, actions on a computer. So the mouse clicks and the keyboard strokes. And in that sense, you can basically automate a lot of processes and tasks. Um, But we see that it's not the only solution for automating certain processes. So we also have other tools um, like APIs and and integrations. Um, And yeah, that's what we actually do the whole day. We have different uh, industries we are focused on, sales and marketing, human resources, um, and uh, advertising. yeah, we can give some examples there, maybe if if that's fun. But uh, that yeah, that's what we do the whole day. John is more focused on the on the scripting, 
and making those uh, automating those processes and i'm more um in the in the calls with clients and and uh that, yeah account manager you could say so what do you do in like the hr space because you said you can give examples mm -hmm. i'm curious because um you know the way i look at things right because like it's the, the yeah. human and technology intersection um it's yeah. what you guys also look at um how does hr work with you guys yeah that's a difficult one because of course the processes are so different per organization and that's also the good part of this kind of automation um but to give you an example um, imagine uh, an hr company wants to um, send out a lot of uh, job posts to different job boards then you can do that for example with um, automation instead of you doing it by hand or going into a certain portal to do it by hand um, you can do it with a robot for example at night or something um, also those things are possible it's it's 24 7 available um, that's one of the examples um, we also wrote an, an article about it maybe you've seen that uh, <laughs> uh, yeah seen that uh, Fetty. it was one of the hr tech articles um, and then we also asked some of the um, hr professionals what are actually the problems you face or the, the the kind of technologies you see rising um in hr in the hr space and in recruitment space yep. and there were yeah actually some interesting findings i think and one of the most important ones was there that um everything is becoming digital which is actually logical you could say uh, more and more meetings are being uh, held to digital for example instead of physical um, but also that tools are more and more interconnected so it's not just uh, an application, uh, a job board tool, a finance tool, and so, so, yeah, so on. It's more of a combination now that you try to focus more on the journey or the path a um, new employee, for example, goes through when entering or onboarding in a company. Um, mm -hmm. And those tools should be connected to each other, but that's not the case a lot of times. Those tools mostly don't have an integration. Um, and that's one of the key things that are happening now in uh, in hr and that we can uh, or we also do a lot in making those integrations making sure applications can talk yep but that wasn't actually even the even the key finding of that research like the key finding was basically the biggest tech trend in hr is no tech um yeah. and that that for a reason that's quite contradictory because like tech no tech what what are you talking about but we talk to a lot of experts in hr and I, literally, I think everyone mentioned like, okay, we're talking about HR. We are doing people work. We're working with people um, every day, talking to people. And I think it's very important to realize HR is always about people stuff. Like technology plays a very important role, but a supportive role. In the end, we still talk to people. We still need to make a connection to people. And you can't do that with a robot or a chatbot. Like you can't, impossible. For now, for now, for now, it's impossible. Yeah. Um, but I think that was a very interesting finding that we actually didn't really realize. We thought, yo, we're in 2022. Tech yeah. is, it's all about tech. But no, it, it, it wasn't that uh, it wasn't the case in HR, no. But isn't, yeah. it, isn't it all about tech in a specific area? Because I think that uh, it, this is a very interesting topic, especially to me, because this is what I also look into, is that, um, Technology is still fine to use, right? But you, you said it quite good is it's it should be an addition to the mm -hmm. human work. Mm -hmm. um, but that means that the technology should be optimized to to make their jobs even easier. Um, but don't you get, and that's that's more a question to you, maybe as, as founders or, or businessmen, don't you run into a conflict where you want to um, implement technology to support people, which means that you're now adding something to the team Mm -hmm. um, you're not taking anything away. Don't you run into the conflict of costs, of cost cutting uh, based on technology? Um, yeah, of course, those, um, how do you say that, um, worries are there with companies that, that may happen. I have to say we focus more on small, medium enterprises, so not on the larger organizations where those topics are maybe less relevant, I, I can imagine. Because um, in a big organization, if you automate one process there, then it mostly has a big impact on that workforce. Uh, while in, in smaller companies, it's mostly a process that, yeah, is just a part of your daily tasks as a, as a employee. And it's impossible at this point in time to automate the complete 
yeah, package of all the tasks that a normal employee performs on a daily basis. So I think that's really key to realize. Um, and that's something we try to make people aware of. We cannot automate at this point everything that you do as an employee. Yep. So albeit creativity, st st strategy work, every employee, it can be maybe the, the most simple task that you can do as an employee, but all, there's always some human um, yeah, involvement needed and some human creativity, st strategy, contact needed. Um, so you can see that uh, that's maybe one more thing interesting is that if you automate a task that a human did before, then that role is more um, shifted to become a, a kind of an analysis, a person that analyzes that um, or monitors that process instead of executing it. But you always need that human. Yep. That's a key thing. And you don't really easily yeah, fire people because of it in that sense. Mm -hmm. But don't you run into to organizations? Well, maybe not for the, for the, for the uh, smaller ones. Mm -hmm. but aren't they scared? Um, maybe the people on the floor, and I don't know if your research shows that, but aren't the people on the floor scared that if you take over one part of their job, it is easier to take over the rest of their job? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, 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 it's something that we actually confront each, each uh, every day, I think. Um, people are naturally scared of robots taking over, and, and I, 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 don't, like, I don't mind them thinking of that because well, logically, um, in industrial area, like you have these robots, physical robots that do the industrial work. So people didn't like have to do it anymore. And I think people are based on that, based their opinion on that happening, uh, that software robots will also do the same. But I think it's our task, Levi, and our task, and maybe also your task, Ferry, to get people to realize that it's not the case. We usually say, um, a software robot, it's your most dumbest employee, like your dumbest. It, it is so dumb, you need to tell him, her, or it everything it needs to do. Uh, but it is your most hardworking employee. Um, the cognitive work, like the serious work, it's always for your real employees to do. Um, robots are literally too dumb to do these jobs, so please don't worry. That's one of the things we use to like ex explain people that it won't happen. But there are also a lot of other mechanisms to do so, such as like explaining, like literally explaining them. What does the technology do? What's the role of the technology? Why is the technology there? And then basically from time to time, it, it, it people start to realize, okay, oh, okay. So this technology isn't as, as advanced as the hype really wants it to be. Um, it's basically a dumb colleague of mine. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's always good to get a colleague that that feels dumber than you. Right? Because <laughs> yeah. no competition, and yeah, I, I yeah. feel that one. Um, <laughs> but I, I, it's it's interesting to hear, and I think um, just as a as a side note, you you guys did a research article on this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I think we should share that in the show notes so people who listen can can go to that article um, yeah. and see for themselves. Um, yep. Was there anything shocking uh, either in there or something in your work the last year or two? that you saw that you thought, wow, this is a, not a good development? It doesn't have to be yours, but just like in, in, in whatever industry or whatever happens. Um, well, I, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Levy as well, and you as well, Ferry. We're on LinkedIn. We're very active on LinkedIn. We read a lot of stuff, especially in tech sphere. And I read an article about chatbots being able to give more human answers. And to be honest, I'm literally, I was literally really shocked about that article because I also mentioned that uh, as a comment to you, Ferry. It was like, at a certain moment, you don't know anymore whether you're talking to a person or a chatbot. And okay, if a company tells you, hey, our chatbot is smart, um, but it's still a chatbot, okay, that's fine. But what if a company thinks, okay, I don't want to people, I don't want people to know that it's a chatbot, but it is a chatbot. That's really scary because then we people actually doubt everything because am I talking to a robot? Am I talking to a chatbot? Who am I talking to? What What's happening? That was for me like really shocking to read. Yeah. And I think in addition to that, actually, I also read something similar. Now we're actually getting to the to the negative part of, of automation. And we just said that it's not possible to automate everything. <laughs> and now we're getting a scary developments. Um, but there was also another thing, actually, I also read on LinkedIn um, that it was possible nowadays to make a piece of content written by an algorithm. So you just give it some input. You say, for example, uh, backpack, 
um, school, give it two keywords, and then it writes a whole article of like three paragraphs um, about a story with a backpack and a school involved. And I think, yeah, just like Sean said, that's actually, I have to say, quite scary. And those yeah, developments are also a bit scary, I think, and I can imagine, um, because you do not know anymore if you are in contact with a human or technology. And in that sense, it will always be a question, do I talk to a, a, a technology or do I talk to yeah, a human, uh, which can be quite scary. But that's also part of how society puts it, I think. And that's actually, like John also said, our role then to educate and to inform people that at least at this point, it's never possible. And probably the upcoming five, 10 years, it's not possible to take over this human contact as, yeah, as, as accurate as possible as how it's going between us three here <laughs> together. Yeah, I think we as humans still have to decide where this whole thing goes. Um, and, and surely I want to stay away from yeah. like the negative part of automation, but I do think there's a part that we should know about, we should be wary about. Um, and especially the, the first example, John, that you gave about that chatbot. Um, I, I think that if you, if you use a chatbot, you should always tell someone because, um, if you, if you're talking to a human being, you also want to know that, right? Uh, you yep. also want to know who you're talking to, at least on first name basis. Um, but you don't want to feel cheated afterwards because I think it's it's deeply emotional. If you talk to a robot thinking it's a human being, you kind uh -huh. of sort of already start a connection. Um, if I talk to someone like a physical human being um, from one of the, the bigger uh, e-commerce uh, uh, businesses that we have in the Netherlands right here, if someone starts to chat and he or she says, hi, this is my name. How can I help you? And I know it's a person. I automatically get connected. And yep. then if they yep. say, I feel sorry for your problem, I'm going to help you fix it. Then mm -hmm. you're my friend because you're going to help me and I like you already. But mm -hmm. if you're a robot and, and I, I kind yeah. of feel like you're my friend and then I find out you're fake, um, that's, that's like finding out Santa Claus doesn't exist. Right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you, you feel cheated. Yep. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's important that, that everyone who is listening, if you want to start a chatbot, go ahead. But make sure that people understand that it is a robot yeah. um, because it also sets um, an, an expectation. And I think that's... And that's one of the things you probably tell, we tell all the brands is if you use technology to talk to clients or to consumers or, or pre-sales, whatever, um, you, you set a certain expectation of your brand. And if the first thing that you have is, an, is, a, is a chatbot mm -hmm. that you think is, is as smart as a human being, yep. then you're going to yep. give people a wrong impression of your brand. They're going to think you're dumb uh, yep. because it's never going to be as intelligent or as em emphatic or, or friendly yep. as a human being. Yep. Um, but I think, and, and you, you will probably underline that, is that you should still try and use technology to make your life easier. It's perfectly fine. Yep. But don't think that it can replace us in the same way that we are. Yeah. Um, yep. I think that that's the biggest message to anyone because I, I often run into this discussion if I talk about technology and humans. Everyone yeah. steers it towards chatbots. Uh, but that just shows that there's a huge pain right there. Uh, yep. The people feel cheated by chatbots. They don't work. Um, one of the, the, the uh, pain, most painful examples that I have is with an insurance company right here where we live. Um, they use a chatbot, which is so dumb that it <laughs> asked me to talk in uh, keywords. I have uh. to use keywords as if I'm like some Google yeah. advertisement, right? Yeah. Um, and then I use keywords and it just doesn't understand what I want. And, I, and even if I, I uh, talk to that organization with a simple question, mm -hmm. no frustration, no emotion, I leave frustrated. That's the opposite yeah. of what you want. You want to take away my pain or anxiety or question, whatever. And you want to send me home with a good feeling. Now you're sending me home thinking you're dumb. I need to talk in keywords and I'm going to leave. <laughs> uh, and that's yeah. a, a painful conclusion. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. That's also the reason why we don't have a chat on our website. Uh, okay. We are not, we are not a B2C company, but you still want like some, a channel to communicate with your um, audience. And we decided to, basically use video. I don't know whether you've seen that, but if you visit our website, you see like a small pop-up with a video. Yeah, that's like basically, it. <laughs> it, it's per basically what we believe, like make it personal, like every single aspect of your company, make it personal. Okay, we do automation, perfectly fine, but make it as personal as possible. Um, imagine like Levi, I, uh, we're talking to Ferry, 
what if Ferry has a very advanced technology that he's basically a robot now and that basically he is not Ferry, but basically a pr- robot that's programmed? How would you feel, Levy? I think you would feel really bad. Me as well. It I feel cheated on, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yep. but that's true, right? Because you're sharing yeah. your story and you think that I care. But if I'm a robot, I <laughs> yeah. don't care, right? That's, that's yeah. the key part. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the, the empathy. And, and I had an interesting discussion a couple of years ago at the University of Rotterdam with someone yep. who said, but I can create a robot that is empathetic. And we said, no, you can create a robot that has <laughs> features that look like being empathetic. It can mimic yeah. our behavior, but it, yep. it's not going to care. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Scary robot. It, Scary. It, it yeah. Is, yeah. Is it, it is. Uh, where is it? <laughs> Does it exist? <laughs> no, oh, no, no, they, no they, oh. they didn't build it yet, uh, thankfully. No. Okay. <laughs> they, they do have a, a, another robot, which is, which is my pain in my ass. And, and I use this every example that I get. Yeah. Um, there's this nursery home. Um, I'm not sure where mm. it is. If it's here, if it's, it's abroad, I'm not sure. Uh, but what they did was they saw this pro- uh, problem in nursery homes. Older people, super lonely, um, and they needed someone to talk to. But mm-hmm. the staff who was working there, who, who basically took on uh, an education of four years and then started working with people, mm-hmm. they were overworked. Uh, they had too much work. They had to do everything in that nursery home. So a company said, look, we're going to build you a robot to help you in your daily work. And they're like, okay, that's awesome. You know, we need some, some air, some, some, we need to take a breath. So they created a robot that is capable of talking to a person, mm-hmm. then scanning your face yeah. and connecting your story to your face. So if I tell you something on Tuesday and the robot's going to come back on Saturday, it's going to say, hey, you told me this a couple of days ago. I still <laughs> remember, which sounds good. So now they sent this robot to talk to these elderly people and they're like, oh, I'm super happy because now I can tell my story and the, the robot's yeah. going to ask me questions because it remembers my story. It cares about me. First of all, the robot doesn't give a shit because it doesn't care about you. Uh-huh. But the worst part is that the people who actually took up this job to care for the elderly are doing yeah. the dishes, doing the groceries, running the errands, um, while that robot is doing the fun part of their work, which is talking yeah. to people and making connections, um, which which pains me because that's the opposite way that we should want to work. Why don't we find some way, something yeah. to yeah. do the dishes, to do the groceries, so that the people working there can talk to the people? Um, and for now it works because the elderly and, and usually they they have mental issues, so they don't yeah, really, you yeah. know, um, and they feel connected because at least they have something to talk to. But mm-hmm. we as a younger generation, I don't want a robot to remember my name and remember my face. I don't even want Facebook to save my picture, let alone a uh-huh. robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. But it's acting like a human being. How can I build uh-huh. a relationship with something that's m- made out of plastic? Yeah. I just can't. Yeah. Well, I believe in Japan, people are marrying robots at the moment. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I really know there's some kind of marriage, uh, <laughs> yeah, possibility to marry it, to marry a robot at least. Yep. So there, yeah, those. It maybe depends on the culture as well. In that sense, actually, when we talk about it, and uh, as you said, it also depends on um, the age you're in. With all respect, if you have mental issues, you also do not understand maybe as we are talking about it now that such a robot doesn't have the empathy that you think it has and is it then a bad thing that's also one of more more like an ethical question actually if a human doesn't understand it is not um um, if the human thinks that a robot is being empathetic is that a problem or not Uh, but i think interesting uh, interesting topics at least well i think we're looking at the wrong side of the spectrum then um, mm. And I don't want to go too deep, but I think um, there's a vast difference between humans and technology when it comes to mm-hmm. skills, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. You, you guys said it before with examples even, we're creative, we yeah. can manage people, we can build relationships, we can do customer service. Then you have robots, and you also said this, they can go on 24-7. They're like the dumbest yeah. but super hardest working people on your team. Yeah. Um, they don't take vacation days, they don't get sick, etc. They can break down, but you can fix them easily, right? So there's a vast difference. Yeah. But if we're already looking at how to put those human skills in robots, mm-hmm. yep. then wh- where does that end? Why don't we optimize yeah. the robot skills first? Um, and why don't we also look at optimizing the human skills? Like, okay, we are looking at technology. We're optimizing that. We're making your life easier, which means that you as a human being, you need to up your skills as well. You need to be more creative, more outgoing, more build relationships, be creative, etc. Um, but if we're already looking at how can we take these human skills and put them in robots, yeah. then it's going to go very quickly. 
Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah. You yep. actually need to focus on the supportive tasks, right? As you mean, like the dishes, etc., and not on the building the human relationships, which a human should do, and not a robot. Yep. Exactly. It reminds me of a table that that that's. I think it, you shared it once, uh, Ferry, about like you have a robot, you have a human, and then you have different types of skills, and then. For, yeah, you mentioned it already. Humans are good at the social stuff. Robots are good at the repetitive stuff, boring stuff. I think your example was very good. Uh, why don't you make robots that run the errands, that do the dishes, so that we people, or not we, but the nurses, can talk to the elderly again? I think that that would be more efficient uh, rather than turning it, basically turning it, uh, making the nurses go run the errands and making the robot talk to the to the to the elderly exactly yep. yeah and i think it's it's good to use technology and and i had this conversation uh, earlier and i'm gonna tease you guys on the next podcast that's coming out this tuesday we yep. had a discussion about transition yep. um i'm gonna steer it a, a little bit differently here there's a transition of jobs um because some jobs are gonna disappear uh but should those jobs be the people working in the nursery homes uh doing the emotional work or should that work be the things that we are not the best at? Um, I've worked mm -hmm. in Rotterdam. I've seen things being built that kind of shocked me, but in a good way. Um, mm -hmm. They built this car that can deliver pizzas because it, it keeps it warm and it knows its location. It uses your phone to oh. find you, etc. That's awesome. And and people argue that that's going to cost this this young 16-year-old pizza guy's job. Um, we, we have uh, uh, robots that are now testing to to deliver your mail or your packages. That's going to cost people at TNT and Post and L, et cetera, their jobs, um, which I understand. But I think we need to move away from certain jobs that are not specifically human. Um, and I don't mean to downplay any job, but not every job requires emotions and creativity. Some is just a process and you need to run it, right? Mm -hmm. You have 10 yeah. parcels and you need to deliver them. That's a process. Um, yeah. And you can optimize the process and you can use technology on that. Mm -hmm. um, but if we start optimizing processes that are humane, th then we run into, into that problem. Um, but how do you guys look at that part? Because I think you already teased it uh, quite a bit in the beginning. Like you guys look at processes to optimize them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those processes are all digital. So we don't talk about physical processes, uh, which are also difficult to automate, I, I can assume um, but as you said for example like a i think domino's or something has that with the pizza that you deliver it in in uh, in cities uh, i think that's a really cool development um but where yeah we are talking more about the digital processes that you automate um and uh, yeah with that there are so many things in a daily task that you perform digitally um so that it's impossible to automate that with a software robot at this point in time. Yep. So it's more the really small task that you execute, like logging into a portal or writing, um, uh, reading emails each morning and categorizing them for, your, as a, for you yep. as a person yep. um, to really support you and not take over anything. Yep, but but it's actually a twofold. Uh, Levy mentioned stuff that's already done by people. That's how I think 99% of the people look at automation, look at specific processes that you already do and automate them. But after, I think, a few months, Levi and I realized, wait, automation isn't really about replacing stuff that you already do with automation. It's also about doing the impossible. That's how we call it internally in our in our organization, doing the impossible, like processing thousands and thousands of documents. Can you as a human do that? No. But can a robot do it? Yes. And then if you look at automation like that, it's it's like opening up new new spaces for you to do stuff in your company that was never able to be done uh, in your company. So that these are like two perspectives in which you can look at automation. It's not always about replacing stuff and, and um, uh, substituting stuff and work to do. It's also about looking at, okay, I always wanted to have X but I couldn't because people couldn't do it. Okay, maybe you can now use a software robot to do it. And then that's that's a very new way to look at it, which I'm, and Levi as well, is very big fan of. But then you're looking yeah. at a, a spectrum that humans just cannot reach, right? Then you're yeah. adding something to, uh, exactly. yeah, that, that's that's super valuable. And yep. do, you, do yep. you guys also measure um, like what impact that has, especially if you automate like small tasks that we're not really aware of, how much time it takes or, so, or do you measure those kind of things? Well, we do measure it, but honestly, it's actually a very unfair competition. You're actually measuring something that 
like for instance, processing thousands of documents, we sometimes make the comparison between, okay, what if a human had to do it? Well, then you're talking about months and months and months of work, eight hours per day, no coffee, no toilet visits, uh, etc. It's actually an unfair competition. Um, but but yeah, sometimes we mention that uh, just to give people an idea of, okay, this is something that you couldn't do anyway. But that's that's the whole thing, right, with automation. Because I don't I don't think we are aware of how powerful automation can be, um, mm -hmm. and how both limited and unlimited human beings are. Um, and with that, I mean um, we are unlimited, as in we're super creative. Because mm -hmm. this robot or this automation that you're talking about is something that humans created, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But on the other hand, we are limited, as in we couldn't do it ourselves. Uh, mm -hmm. We need those coffee breaks and. Um, and I, I want to go maybe a little bit into like the, the mental health space is also mm -hmm. that we don't even have the brain capability to keep up for eight mm -hmm. hours of focused work per day, super productive. Um, that's just a big difference because humans are not really productive in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how how yeah. does um, uh, an organization that you, you talk to, how do they look at like this kind of issue? Like if you tell them this, how do they, do they react? In what way do you exactly mean then? Well, if, that if, you, you, if you talk to them and you show them like, yeah. look, if we if we create this automation, it's going to be super productive yeah. versus human beings who are limited on, on that spectrum. How do they react? Do they see those differences? Um, yeah, they do see that. Um, and as you said, there is also kind of an ignorance, if I can say in that way, about automation and what it can do and what it means in an organization. Um, what we are always saying, Chen and I, is that automation is just there we come back to the same story actually, but that it's doing the repetitive stuff. It's doing things that you tell him to do. It's a dumbass employee. You tell him exactly where to click um, or yeah, in case of robotics uh, at least, but you tell him exactly what to do um, and, and a human cannot. So, um, or a robot can do that 24 seven and a human cannot, that's what I mean. Um, so that's, I think the key difference is that you don't, humans are, definitely productive but they're not productive when it comes to doing the same thing 24 7 or eight hours a day you could say um and that the question is if that's actually yeah a human uh problem or not i don't think so um in that sense if i already go on to like a next uh, stage of uh, this conversation because i think in the end people are meant to be creative and be um more focused on the human side of things and not on the robot side of things because we all have kind of a robot in ourselves, um, but we don't want to take that robot um, out in the workplace um, and keep it inside of us and use that robot energy kind of for the more strategic uh, things. Robot energy. Very yeah, nice. it, we never robot. use this way. But <laughs> robot energy. This robot energy. Book. This is all for Everyone book. has some robot. I'll write it down now. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes it makes sense. I, I understand what you mean because we we can actually we can work as robots. Um, I, yeah. I speak from experience that I have worked as a robot. Uh, <laughs> in, well, no, that's but it, I, everyone I, does I it. Not, yeah. yeah, but but it's true. But yeah. I, I I think I was the best robot ever. I, I, mean, <laughs> I was working for. Um, I think they should have talked to you guys before they hired me. It was like my last job that I had before I started my own mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. Um. And they hired me to uh, to their sales team to like increase their capabilities and and skills and whatever, and it sounded like a super super good challenge. Like okay, I can use my sales and marketing background to you know talk to this team, make them better, etc. And so they said the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna pick the orders in our warehouse, which is something mm -hmm. that I fully agree with because there's no better way to integrate into a company and to learn about all their all their uh, parts and 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 products that they have. So I did that for one or two weeks. I connected mm -hmm. with the guys working there. Um, and then I went back to the office and, and they said, well, you're going to start now. Um, you're working in the sales department. So you're going to do exactly what they are doing just to make sure that you also get to know them. Um, I'm like, okay, cool. So show me the work and the work they did. And you're going <laughs> to laugh about this. The work that they did is um, they work in a big industry and they get, I think about like two to 300 quotation requests per day. Mm -hmm. So they take in these requests, then they create a quotation, they send it to the client and they either order or they don't. Um, so what they did is every quotation request, they printed it out and put it in this like stack. Then you need to take about like 15 or 20 from that stack, then manually type them into your system, 
which oh. already, yeah, I mean, you're shocked already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you type them into your system by hand. So you're looking at your, your paper, you're typing them in. Then you're sending the quotation to the client. Then the client either ignores you or he sends back, okay, I'm going to order this. Uh, you yeah. have a button to create an order from a quotation, right? To, to convert it. But they didn't want that because then it would disappear from their archive. <laughs> so you had to print out the, the order request and then type it all out again and then what? send the order confirmation. Yeah. And then you got a purchase order. You needed to print it out that as well. Then the three of them, you uh, staple them together and put them in a physical map. And then at the end of the week, we dumped the whole map into the trash can and started Monday the next day. Um, so so i said well there's a couple of issues right here yeah. because like th this is robotic work right mm -hmm, printing it mm -hmm. out typing it in um and i said well what is the reason why uh, uh let me put it this way do you know how many orders we're getting versus quotations we're sending so what is your conversion rate which is a basic mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. and the answer was we don't know because we never talk to the clients <laughs> so I made a sales yeah. plan, right? Because that was what I was hired for. At mm -hmm. least that's what they told me. So I made a sales plan and said, step number one, talk to your clients. Give me yep. a couple hours a week. Let, let me talk to them and ask them, thanks for doing business with us. What do you purchase on a regular? Um, are we your biggest seller, etc.? You know, just the basic questions. Um, and the second one was, please, God, help me automate part of my job because this is robotic <laughs> work. We have so many tools that can already yeah. do this without, yep. you don't even need to invent them. You just need to purchase them. Yep. Um, so I gave them that sales uh, document and <laughs> my manager said, well, it's look, it looks good, but I don't think we have time for that because we have this whole stack of quotations that you still need to type in. Um, and that just went into a loop and it took me about two months when I said, well, I'm done. I'm yeah. not going to do this anymore. Um, and then they, they, I think they purchased this product that was like super low quality and it scanned the quotations coming in. But you still mm -hmm. had to like uh, amend the whole document because there were so many errors that it even took longer mm -hmm. than just typing it in yourself. So what they bought didn't even work. They, it was actually working against us, making our jobs even harder. Um, and that's when oh. I said, I, I quit. This is, I don't want to work as a yeah. robot. Yeah. I was done. Yeah. The robot energy was empty. Yeah. <laughs> it was. But it yeah. was. But it, I, I, I super understand what you say with robot energy. It's yeah. like you kind of numb down and you stop using your brain and you start mm, yep. being super productive. And I think the good part of it is that I started finding ways to become quicker. I started optimizing myself and my processes. Um, yeah. Like, okay, mm -hmm. if I don't take 10 or 15, or if I make like an Excel sheet with these type of things already in there or whatever, or I open 10 tabs at the same time, I'm quicker. It, it's like shaving minutes off the whole day. Um, but the problem yeah. is that because I was be I was optimizing myself, my manager said, well, you shaved off about five minutes of your day, so you can do two more, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Work because there's always yeah. more work so yeah. i stopped yep. optimizing myself as well um but yeah. I, I i fully understand what you mean if you say yeah. robot energy That's and you so also you also feel productive i guess because you execute things you do things and maybe with doing strategy work or creative work you don't really see the output it's more abstract and that makes you may make you feel less productive in a way but actually yeah, it doesn't have to be. It can be still really productive, of course, but you just don't see that output as as clearly as um, as you do with executing things. It is, yep. and I yeah, think we've, we've been conditioned as well, right? Um, mm. As as humans, when uh, in the same job or the job that I had before, um, if I wasn't at my desk, I was deemed not at work. Um, yeah. If I was, if if I were to take 15 minutes just to walk around the building and think about the process, or how, how am I going to do this, or mm. Uh, who do I need to talk to to get this fixed? Yeah. I was away from my desk. Doesn't mean I'm not working, mm -hmm. but I'm not at my laptop. Um, but exactly. they say, well, you've yeah. been away for 15 minutes. Where were you? I was like, I was working. No, you weren't because you weren't at your laptop. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's interesting. It, yeah. But it, it, it is true because we, we kind of feel like working is done on a laptop. Um, yeah. And now after like breaking away from it, and, and actually Jonathan, my, my, my best friend and co-founder, he told me, um, that I still had that problem when we were working, when we started the company. Because um, like I said, we sat in McDonald's, we, we could be there yeah. for like two, three hours, just having a couple of chicken nuggets and, and, <laughs> and working and thinking and brainstorming yeah. and, and putting things on paper. And I said, well, I'm going to go back home because I've got work to do. And he said, well, you're working <sighs> right now. And I was like, yeah, yeah. that's true. I, I said, but I'm not on my laptop. I'm not productive. He said, yeah. you are yeah. productive. You don't need your laptop to be productive. Oh. That's so interesting. Yeah, I was so, I was so conditioned. Yeah, it reminds me of something of Google. They have Slack time. So they give you, 
I, it should be real. They give you like 20% of your time or something as an employee um, for you to just stop working on your laptop and think about new crazy ideas with your creativity. Just think of the craziest ideas that you can imagine. And through that, they invented, I believe, Gmail, which is now yeah, one of the biggest per services of Google, if not the biggest. Um, so yeah, you can see that just slacking off those 20% of your executional work on the laptop may come with the biggest ideas in the end for your organization. Yep. You made me recognize, like your story, Ferry, makes me realize that I had it basically last week. We, Levi and I were standing at a business event. We were talking to nice people the whole day and it felt really good because we were like not at the office and talking to people. But in the end, Levi, I told you, after these three days, I feel like I haven't done anything for the business. Yeah. And then I was like, wait, we were standing for our business over there. So we basically did something, but we actually, it felt like we didn't. And that's basically, I think, because of the reason you mentioned, we weren't sitting behind our laptop. So it felt like we had three not so productive days. Well, basically it was more productive than ever before, I think. Yeah, because we're yeah. so conditioned of seeing ourselves. I, I think, Levi, you, you use the right word, it's execution. But Absolutely. execution is just part of the work. Uh, yeah. You need to do the thinking before you need to do the execution, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I think that's a, a misconception that still many people and managers and organizations have that being productive means sitting down and doing physical work exactly. or, or executing mm -hmm. something. Um, but I think the example of Google is interesting because um, I kind of like it, but I say kind of mm. because who are they to determine that 20% will be enough for me? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying that we, we should all slack off the whole day, but I think... Um, and, and again, this is from people who I've spoken to and, and also a bit of ex experience that um, we, we are not always productive in the same type of ways um, mm -hmm. on the same moments or in the same length of time. Um, so it could be that I am not behind my laptop for 90% of one week and still do more work than I've ever done before. Yeah. Um, so I, I think putting something like that in percentages still kind of caps your creativity yeah. in a sense. Yeah. But I, I understand they, they do need to cap it somewhere, right? Because mm -hmm. if they say, just do whatever you like, then everyone's going to wonder <laughs> not do anything anymore. Um, so yeah. I kind of like it. But on the other hand, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it feels kind of robotic to cap something yeah. uh, because we, we all work differently. Um, it could be that I'm productive for like one full hour per day. And the rest is just thinking and de-stressing yeah. and whatever. Who knows? Um, and for you, it might be, I, I just need to work 10 hours straight and feel good about myself and then take the rest of the week yeah. off. I, I don't know how anyone works. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to put a cap on, on something like that. For yeah. sure. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's actually what we are in as a society now, to find a balance in that and make sure that we all kind of i think we are going more to a society at least where you can decide yourself you can work from home hybrid working um and you can work at night if you want and work during the day i think in some <laughs> organizations that is already possible maybe google also now um so yeah i think it's an interesting one as you said and that's something we should all yeah we're kind of in that transition at least in society now to figure out for yourself what is best for you yep yeah and how are you I guys think, doing that yeah. oh sorry yeah go ahead Oh yeah, I I just I just thought of like a very good example. Also in Rotterdam, you're in Rotterdam, very uh, cool blue has a very playful office. I I remember um, they have these slides in their office, if I'm correct. But like they have these rooms with that that actually um, yeah really stimulates creativity. And I think that's that's really something from new companies that they are really really making their workspace more. Um, yeah, how do we call that? They enable creativity, basically. Um, that's really nice to see. It's very different from back in the days, the old people, these boring offices. Um, so yeah, it's a nice, nice development to see. And I think we as, as business owners can also take a lot of learnings from that because basically I think it works. Yep. It does. I, I think they, they saw the example. I'm not saying they, they stole it, but the, they saw the example from uh, Zappos uh, in the 90s and mm, 2000s. Yeah. Have you guys heard about Zappos? Yeah, from uh, Jeff Bezos, right? Or related uh, to him at least, or like he take, took over the company or something. Yeah, it was Tony yeah, yeah. G who had the company at first. Uh, yeah. It was purchased by Amazon a couple of years ago. Well, okay. Of, yeah. okay, it's already a Yeah, company. I think it's a while well ago. Yeah. <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, yeah. But he started out the company with this vision of um, creating like a, a home out of outside of your home. 
um, because he knows that people feel most comfortable in their home. And if you're comfortable, you're more productive. Um, and he also said, and that's one of the things that really stuck, um, is he had this customer service. Mm -hmm. And he said, your focus on the telephone is not to convert every conversation into a sale. Mm -hmm. Your job is to make sure that people want to come back. And mm -hmm. so they have this record of, I think, one customer talking to their employee for six hours straight. Um, no break, nothing at all, because he or she was lonely and just wanted to talk and they became friends on the phone. Um, but the, the CEO was like, oh, that's, that's amazing. That's something we need to share, like six hours uh -huh. on the phone. Yeah. No purchase was made, but they had six hours on the phone. And he said, I don't want every conversation to be focused on sales because that's transactional. I want you to focus on creating a relationship. Um, uh -huh. But then uh, there are so many bigger organizations that still don't do it. And I think Cool Blue is a good example because what they do is also make it democratic. Because mm -hmm. I, I know for a fact that one of their meeting rooms is called the Kuip, which is the name of uh, a mm -hmm. Dutch stadium, football stadium, which was uh, chosen by a team of their employees. Because they just said, okay, you have an empty meeting room, decorate it, give it a name, you're free to do it. Because that makes you feel most comfortable because it's also your creation. And it's your adding to the organization. Yep. Yeah. And, and what I think is, um, uh, and I'm going really deep, but I think that adds way more value to you as an employee um, than things like free fruit or free gym uh, uh, facility. Yep. Right? Because now you're actually adding something to your workplace. And that's the same as um, Innocent Smoothies has done. I don't know if you've seen the documentary. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, that, the, the founder of that organization, um, he is meted by, I think it's Pierce Morgan. I'm not pretty sure, but that's like a really posh English guy. Um, <laughs> he, he, he drives up in a Bentley and then he gets out of the car and he talks to the founder. And the founder is in like on, on slippers, flip-flops, um, and he's wearing shorts. Uh, and this guy's like, look at me, I'm in my tie and you're in your shorts. Um, and the guy says, what car do you drive? Like, I, I took the Bentley. And the founder said, I've got this van which covered with grass because we just thought it was cool. Um, and then they walk around their office building and people are sitting on these like bouncy balls. Um, their kitchen is decorated with grass and, and it's like a home kitchen. It's got everything. You can even cook right there. Um, and that's where he said, like, the most important thing is if fe people feel that they can be themselves, yeah. To an extent, because one uh, uh, on a day someone showed up just wearing their, I think it was their robe and didn't comb their hair and stuff. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of the limit, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to feel comfortable at work. Yep. Um, oh, and yep. I'm curious, like you guys are still younger. You're, you're a pretty young generation. You're founders. Um, how do you do your own work? Like, do you come in and on nine and do you go home by five or how, how do you guys see this? Yep. Uh, I, I want to answer this question. I like this question. <laughs> um, we we really want to do things differently. Uh, we're both Levi and I. We are really about efficiency. Like everything has to be efficient. Um, so I had an internship in Hong Kong, and it was a tech company, tech startup company, and I learned really uh, a lot there. They basically said, "I don't care what you wear at work. You're not going to walk a mod uh, like a model show. You're going to work, and you're going to do stuff for us. And that's the only thing that counts. You can you can wear shorts if you want." unless there are clients at the office but in in like general terms you could wear chores it's, it was everything was fine and i i was a really big fan of that because in the end um if you're comfortable you can do the most work and i'm i'm really a big fan of that um so i think we really translated that that thinking from my internship into our own company like i don't care what we do at the company in the end we just need to get have, have results and that's it I think Levi, you can confirm yeah. that with me. Yeah, for sure. And I think what's also fun is that in the end, we did, did want to have an office like this. So of course, before this, we worked from home. Um, you could say, okay, you are as free as you want because you work from home. You can wake up when you want and <laughs> work when you want in a sense. Um, but actually for us to at least, that didn't really work. You go out of your bed and immediately go to the office. It's like your private life and your work life is imbalanced. And yeah, that's not healthy, at least for us. Um, and we were also not productive after a few months of living that way. So um, yeah, I think it's important in the end to have an office, at least for us. And how you go to the office, yeah, how, what you wear, we don't really care, of course. <laughs> that's fine. It's all about what you bring to the office mentally and not physically. Yep. I and that's Levy, you have a big, like the biggest, best example of this uh, behind you. We 
replace our desk with a couch. Uh, Levi, if you move like your your body, oh no, we still can't see it. Yeah, yeah there's he, a he couch over there. We can see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, um, there's a couch behind Levi because um, we believe that okay, we have a very nice office. We have like tables, but. It shouldn't be that serious. Like a couch is okay at the office. Sometimes you just need to to relax and just get your mind zen, and then you can continue with work. So that's why we decided to just put a couch at the office. And Levi isn't really a big fan of the couch uh, for his own uh, allergic reasons, but I'm a big <laughs> fan of the couch. Sometimes I just lay on the couch, um, and then suddenly I say to Levi, Levi, I have a fantastic idea. And then I go back to my desk, and then we have an <laughs> idea. <laughs> So that, that that that's an example of how how we do it at the company. Yeah. Yep. But I think and then the, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh yeah. A quick thing. We also have a table where we thought, okay, let's make a little corner where we can lunch together. But in the end, we never go there, and that's also something so typical of us, at least, and I think in the workplace, you just figure out your own yeah work life, and it's it's, it's funny because some plans just don't turn don't turn out to be the way that you expect it to be. That's true. Yeah, you just need to find like your own way, right? And I think that yeah. also speaks to like we said before, um, laying on the couch thinking, and then suddenly coming up with a good idea might even be more productive than sitting behind your laptop and trying to think or trying to do something. Um, and I think especially after the the two crazy years that we had, um, I think I speak for for many people that you have periods where you look at your screen and you just don't know what you want to do. Um, yeah. I've had those experiences the last two years often when I sat here and I thought, okay, I need to be productive um, when I still thought that needed to be done by a laptop. And then I was staring at my screen and I didn't really know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I kind of did small things that didn't really make an impact on my day. And then at the end of the day, I thought, okay, I've done things for eight hours straight but I didn't mm -hmm. really produce anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I might have as well taken four hours of my day watching TV and like, you know, settling and, and you know, mm -hmm. taking my mind off of things because that's also where you get your best ideas, right? Laying on a couch, uh, in the shower, wherever. I don't <laughs> think the best ideas come from staring at a screen. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if, we, if we can break away from that feeling that, that pr productivity yeah. is being done behind your screen, I think you can win a lot. And I think you have a great example of that. Like just stay on your couch and think. Doesn't mean you're not working. Mm -hmm. but you don't have to be behind the laptop to be at work, right? Agree. Yep. Definitely yep. agree. And the executional part, as we all know it, can be automated or can be done by someone else. So why would you actually spend so much time in that at least? The, the real big value is, as you said, Ferry, in an ID that you have that while laying on a couch or something that's where it all starts it all starts with an id and how you execute it that can actually anyone do in a sense you don't have to do it mostly not necessarily yourself exactly and yep. the execution yeah. follows your idea right because once yeah. you get the idea like okay i know i'm gonna do this then yeah. give me an hour we'll I'll, I'll figure yeah. out how i'm gonna implement this and that, yeah. that's exactly. the way it works yeah for sure Exactly. Right. I also wanted, like you, you mentioned something in your example about the call of six hours and creating relationships. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I really want to dive into that specific topic because Levi and I are really into creating relationships. And I think for this, we really need to be, give a big shout out to someone on LinkedIn. Peter Res is his name. Um, he really taught us that creating relationships is a very important aspect in business. Um, you don't tell someone on the streets, hey, I have this product. Do you want to buy it? Yes or no? <laughs> okay, here, here's some cash. Okay, all right. That's not how it works. You need to create relationships with people. People need to trust you in order to uh, work with you. And and that's, that's actually really something that we realize is so important when doing business. Creating these relationships, um, be personal with people, talk to them, like be really interested in what they do. Um, be really interested in how they do stuff. And then maybe you can help them. But if not, the worst thing that can happen is that you had a very good conversation. Um, yeah. Maybe Levi, you can add more to that because you're, you're more the, the, the sales guy. Yeah, no, well, I think we, as you said, every conversation adds value in the end because you or get maybe sales or business out of it, or you learn from it in a way. Actually, always learn from it because if you get sales out of it, you can also learn why did that happen and what did go well. Um, but you can always learn from every conversation. And I think that is maybe one of also a bigger misconception in maybe sales and business development is that you only want to have a meeting for the purpose of sales. And if you don't have that meeting, then, oh man, it's shit. Uh, we didn't work out well. I have a bad day immediately. Um, 
but you forget actually the yeah the the personal touch and actually why we're living as humans you want to communicate and have relationships with humans not to um yeah unconsciously change uh, ch um follow goals which are is happening too much i think that your that companies get so goal oriented that they their humans and their workforce actually becomes kind of toxic in a sense and that you do not yeah cherish those valuable relationships at zeppos for example yeah true i yeah. think um um if you go into uh, a conversation or a relationship with no expectations, mm. then good things can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I start every meeting with the assumption or, or the goal to drive sales, <laughs> people are going to also feel that. Like, oh, you're just talking to me because you want to sell yeah, me something. Yeah. You don't care about me, my business, my clients. Um, and I think ultimately that's where the economy is moving as well, right? We need to help each other accomplish things. Um, and I think you, you can, and I think that's even bigger than that. I think if you talk to, if you don't talk to someone, if you if you approach someone on the street like, hey, buy my product, how am I gonna know that what I'm doing is a good fit for you if I don't even know you? Yeah. And if I talk yeah. to you and we had a conversation a year ago, you guys exactly. told me things that also made me think like, okay, wait, yeah. you found something else, you have specific needs, you have specific findings. Let me reconsider what I'm offering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, we had a meeting and and you asked me, John. Uh, I said that was six months ago, maybe even longer. Um, I think the three of us went into that conversation with um, the, the goal to learn from each other. Like, who are you? Yep. What are you doing? What do you see in your space? Um, not with the goal to either sell something to each other mm -hmm. or try and do business, but more like, okay, you guys are doing interesting stuff that correlates to my business. Yep. Um, let's see what you're about. Let's see who you are. Why are you in this space? Um, I found you guys to be really awesome and open and, and friendly which is why I want to continue the conversation that we're having right now and that we had before. Um, <laughs> and that's how you build a relationship. And then ultimately, I might run into something and think, wait, these guys that think they have what this client needs or this person needs, and then I'm going to hook you up. And I think that's where sales is going in the future. Um, it's relationship-based. It's not like hard sales. And, and it, I think it's, it's that, that's it. Exactly. I think we had enough of hard selling to put it that way i think it's more of, a, of the past sales that yeah you call people cold calling you kind of force people to believe in your product or to have that problem and you try to find different doors to get to that problem while in reality the best conversion is in the end that a client really has that problem and comes back to you and you are top of mind and that person thinks hey i do really have a problem now and i know um, automation or maybe Tink can solve this or maybe Ferry can um, help, my, help me here. Yeah, then they come back to you and the deal is easier too and you have had a good relationship before that because yep. it all starts with the relationship. It, it, Otherwise, they don't know you. Yeah. And the thing is that um, I'm, I'm reading this book right now. It's, it's called uh, Predictably Irrational. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's super interesting. It's about the human mind and, and it, this is the topic not specifically on sales but um, he shows, the, the, the author shows by example and by studies that he, he's done yeah. at MIT, um, that once you um, bring money to the equation, then you start a different type of relationship. Mm. Then it gets <laughs> transactional. And then people start to look at the value of things. Um, so he gives an example, like if I ask both of you to help me uh, move my couch because I'm moving out next week. Um, if I call uh, Levy and I'm like, okay, can you help me? And he's like, oh yeah, sure, I like you, I'm gonna help you. Sure, I'll come over and we're gonna move that couch. Um, and if I also ask John and I say, um, can you help me move my couch? I'll pay you $30. Then he's gonna think, okay, you're only gonna pay me $30 for like two hours work. That doesn't seem like a good deal. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. gonna go into a trans transactional relationship with me because mm -hmm. I'm offering yeah. him work and, and, and I'm pay him, paying him for his time. Mm -hmm. With Levy, I'm building a relationship based on like friendship and trust because you want to help me and you know that if you want to move your couch someday, I'm going to come over and yeah. help you, right? It yeah. doesn't have to be the next day, but that's a whole different type of relationship that you're building. If, yep. And that happens so often. And you guys are also on LinkedIn, so you get this probably daily as well. <laughs> Mm -hmm. These DMs with I'm I'm gonna buy uh, I'm gonna build your website I'm gonna do this I'm gonna oh, do that yeah. <laughs> this is my company this is what I do blah 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 and it's always me 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 and this is what I do and this is my business and this is what I cost pay me pay me and I'll help you mm -hmm. like first of all uh, it shows that you don't give a shit about my business because you're just talking about yours um, mm -hmm. but it's transactional like from the start 
which mm-hmm. means that they are doing that practice of I walk on the street and they approach me and I, yeah. hey, I don't even, I'm not even going to ask your name. I'm just going to sell you my product. Um, yeah. Whereas people who build a relationship, you're going to understand each other, but you're also going to um, give people something in return if you want to. I, I want my friends to do well. So if they need something, I'm going to provide. Yep. Um, and I know it's the other way around. The same thing is in business. If I like you and I understand your business and I'm likable and you're likable, then you're going to help me and I'm going to help you. Yep. Um, and I think that's the only way. And, and like I said in the beginning, if I don't know who you are, how can I provide you with a product if I don't even know what your needs are? Yeah, exactly. And it will come back to you, at least that's what we believe. If you act good and you focus on making relationships and as you said, Fede, you help each other, then that um, yeah, will come back to you, that positivity. And that other person will help you one day with uh, moving a couch, for example. Yeah. So yep. that, that relationship in, um, in well, as we talk here, maybe a bit more sales, is so important to uh, manifest and no, not only transaction. Sales, then. Yeah, exactly. That's also why I'm like, still, yeah, yeah, no, true. It's actually not really sales uh, in that sense. Um, it's actually yeah. making making new friends and accidentally they, they, they buy something from you. Yeah. Now, sometimes <laughs> legit, it feels like that. It's like speaking to new people, get to learn something new about their industry. It actually feels so much nicer than, hey, I'm going to sell you something. Here it is. Okay, bye. Levy, never see you again. It's it's so much different and it feels so much better. So also for the sales guy, well, for a sales guy without these hard, hard sales goals, it feels better. And I think their job is much, much nicer to do as well. Yeah, and I think there the problem is though with the goals because salespeople nowadays have so many goals they need to chase. And because of that, you are also forced as a sales guy to focus on transactional uh, relationships or if you can call that a relationship, (laughs) on transactional mindset at least and not focus on building a relationship. That's hard to quantify and also hard to see the results from because it can take maybe six months. You don't know, maybe it takes also one month actually. Um, but yeah, I think there is still of a bit of a gap, you could say, in um, between a manager and between you know, traditional managers and uh, salespeople. Yeah, but that goes deep, right? Because an organization needs a specific amount of revenue or turnover. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you do need to reach those goals. But I, I think, and, and there's also studies on that, that especially now people who purchase and then looking at the B2B side of it, they don't buy based on cold calling or cold acquisition anymore. Uh, when mm-hmm. I did that in 2000 and 2009, it was still pretty normal. Like you call the business, hey, do you need this or that? And they would yeah. either purchase yes or no. Mm-hmm. Um, but nowadays they do research. <laughs> they have LinkedIn and and, and internet and Google. Yeah. Um, so the, people are more focused on like problem and solution. Mm-hmm. So they have a problem and they're first going to Google, this is my problem, how do I fix this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, my, my processes are are uh, slow or people are not productive. How do I fix this? And then they mm-hmm. end up with you guys and then they learn about automation. Then they're going to compare you to other people doing automation and then they're going to learn about different types of mm-hmm. automation. Mm-hmm. And that's how it works right now. So when, when you have a relationship with someone and they run into this problem and they're like, oh, I know the right guys who can fix my problem, then they're going to come back to you. So you're also not focused on the timing anymore. Because when you're doing call to calling, yeah. you need to call at the exact right time, say the yeah. right thing, talk to the right person. Exactly. Um, but if you build a relationship, then you're going to build it on trust. And then people are going to find you because they know what you can do, what you're capable of. Exactly. So I think sales yeah. is turning into branding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yep. Yep. Very good Which point. Which is a good thing because I hate cold calling. And I know <laughs> people also hate it. So yeah. people on the line also hate it. They don't want to be yeah. called. They're working yeah. right now. So I hate it. I'm yeah, me too. Well, I'm from the younger generation. I'm 24, so not really young, but also not really old. I hate it when people cold call me. When I get a telephone, they say, hey, I have this product. I say, okay, thank you so much. Bye. Like, they don't even ask how how I am at that day. I'm like, okay, damn, this this feels weird. Yeah. It's yep. so unpersonal. It's it's you, you can sense it focused on their sales and their goals and on them. It's on them. It's me, 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 and they don't care about you. Exactly. And it's different yeah. when, for instance, when Ferry calls me, and he's like, hey, I have this new thing. And I'm like, Ferry, I know you. <laughs> we have contact yeah, yeah, yeah. on LinkedIn. We had a very good conversation. Let's go. When do we meet? Uh, from my side, I, I, I signed on yesterday already. So it's <laughs> a bit different. It's really different. Yep. It is. Yeah. And I think if, if I speak to, to what we're doing, like most of our, our sales are driven from when we talk to people, when we go to do keynotes, when, when we're in front of people telling a story, a story mm-hmm. that connects to them. 
and they can make the decision if they need it, yes or no. I don't want to push it on anyone. If you don't exactly. need it, please don't purchase it if you don't need it. Yeah, only buy it when you need it, indeed. Because then also you believe or you really need that value that you provide as a service or as a product. And you also get less um, yeah, problems or, for example, pricing for, or, or yeah, kind of trying to convince those people still at the last dying seconds in the deal because those people already know you, you have a good relationship and yeah, they know what you can offer. So it's not going to be about kind of the, the side things like pricing and, and other potential uh, bottlenecks in, in a deal. Yeah, and they know your worth because they know yeah. you. So you know yep. they know what you can deliver. And if you exactly. name them your price, like, okay, yeah, sounds reasonable because I know you're going to do the job because I know yeah. you and I trust you and I want you to do this for me. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And if you start from a transaction mindset, then you always focus on the pricing as well. And it all gets gets yeah, more and more difficult as well as a company. Then. But it has to be, right? Because if you're like, if you're uh, uh, an organization, you're e-commerce, you're new to me and your, uh, your competitors are equally uh, the same. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to compare you on pricing and on, I don't know, like the, the, the reviews yeah. that you have on your product. I don't care about your shop. I don't care about your website. But mm -hmm. if I know you and I, yeah. I'm not even going to compare you because I can, I can already tell that, you know, what you're offering is valuable. So I'm going to take it. Um, exactly. So you take away the whole comparison. Um, it's, it's the same with friendships. If I want to spend a day with someone I don't know, I'm going to look at, okay, who are you? Where are you from? <laughs> what do you look like? But if I have to choose yeah. between two of my friends, I'm like, okay, sure. I know who I'm going to take because I know who they are, what they do, what they're about. Um, yep. And it's, it's not different in business. I think, John, you, you said it correctly. Like you, you make friends and then you go into business with them rather than trying to sell something to someone and then hope they come back someday because your friends yep. are going to come back to you. Exactly. Yeah. Really well said. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, on, on that note, uh, because I think we can we can talk for hours, um, yeah. but I, I think uh, we should we should close down with a final statement, if if you would be so uh, so kind. Mm -hmm. um, a, a final thought for whoever is listening could be anything. Um, do you to start with you, Levi? Do you have a final thought for us? As in, like, uh, what kind of topic? No, whatever you like. Or whatever I like. Um... Yeah, without being too sales, of course. No, <laughs> no. Focus on, um, yeah, focus on the human side. I would say, focus on the human side of things. Keep on focusing on that, and tech cannot easily uh, replace that anyway. So keep on focusing on improving your own human side, like creativity, strategy, um, that kind of work. It's not a real only one statement, few sentences, but okay. <laughs> It doesn't have to be short. It has to be on yeah. point. And, and I think yeah. this is on point. Thank you. And then what about you, John? Do you have a final thought for us? Well, I think uh, we already mentioned it, but focus on relationships. Um, I'm a big believer of boring work, technology, creative work, like warm work, but like social work, do it yourself. I'm like a really big fan of that. So my, my statement would be focus on relationships and everything that's boring and repetitive, that technology do it. That's my statement. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. I can only add to that by saying <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you guys for being here today. It was a pleasure talking to you again. Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Thanks for having us, uh, Ferry. Sure. It was a pleasure. I think we should do yeah. a, a part two because I think there's <laughs> lots more that we can talk about. Yeah. Um, yep. For now, thank you for being here. And to you out there listening, thank you. Stay tuned and stay human. <laughs>